Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Weather for Boating webinar. For those joining us for the first time, welcome. And for anyone who joined us for our webinar before, welcome back. Today we'll be discussing how to read the forecast before you set out on the water. My name is Jordan and I'll be your moderator today. I'm joined by Claire who will be producing today's webinar as well. Together we will make the webinar as interactive as possible. So before we start, I've got to ask for your attention so we can cover off a few housekeeping items. Today's broadcast will run for about 60 minutes with plenty of time allocated for questions. This webinar is also being recorded and the video will be shared with you via email. For first time webinar attendees, please see some helpful tips on your screen. Most importantly, please note the chat box. This is where you can send through any of your questions or feedback for the presenters. Please use this box and not the Q&A box to send your questions to us during the session and we will answer as many as possible during the allocated breaks. So if you want to test out the chat box now, feel free to tell us your name and where you're dialing in from. So in response to feedback from previous webinars, here is some information about how to participate in the polls. We'll do two of them during the uh, webinar and when they're in motion, attendees will see a set of questions on the right of their webinar screen. Please select your choice uh, followed by the submit button below them. I'll also take this moment to thank those of you who sent in questions during the registration process. We have developed the content of this session in accordance with those common themes of those questions, so thank you for engaging with us. And finally, enough about me, I'm delighted to introduce you to our presenters, David McQueen and Lucy Bloom. Good. Hello. Hey, how you going? So, Lucy helps manage the Bureau's Marine Weather Services, and this includes products for the high seas, coastal water areas and lakes. She works with a range of marine customers to improve future services, uh, and Lucy was also a certified scientific diver, that's pretty cool, but only finds time to go snorkeling now and is still on the search to spot a weedy sea dragon. Hello, Lucy. Hi, how's it going? Very good. David, uh, he is the Bureau's Tsunami and Marine Competency Trainer. He has extensive experience with marine forecasting guidance, tools and service development. Uh, as a coordinator of the Bureau's Graduate Meteorologist course, David ensures that the next generation of meteorologists are prepared to deliver marine forecasts and warning services. He also has a keen personal interest in marine weather and is an avid kayaker. Hi, David. Good how are you doing? Yeah, really good. good. So, welcome all. Lucy, you're going to take us through uh, what we'll be hearing about today. Yeah. So, thanks, John. Uh, today, what we'd like to do is just work through a bit of a mock scenario of planning for a day sailing trip, so looking at the forecast a few days in advance and then working through those steps that we would normally go through. Uh, so we'll be looking at the different parts of the forecast, some of our different tools that we have available to help you out, and um, yeah, look at what's available then on the day as well as in advance. All right. This is basically just an extension of the types of weather briefings that we would give at a sailing club or some of those higher profile events like the Sydney to Hobart Yacht Race. Um, we will cover essentially those five vital safety checks that we promote. Hopefully some of the people dialed in today are familiar with our five vital weather safety checks. Um, so we'll be stepping through how those um, feed into your, your planning steps as well. Excellent. A lot to learn today. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm not, uh, I think people call me a land lover, I guess. Uh, I might have uh, land separation anxiety, but we'll figure that out during the actual webinar. Uh, so before we get stuck into the talk, let's hear a little bit more about your boating habits with a quick poll. So the poll will come up to your uh, right hand side at the moment and the poll question is, what type of vessel do you use most often? Now there's a kayak, SUP or other paddlecraft, that's option A. B is a smaller powerboat, like a teeny. C is a larger powerboat. D is a sailboat. Or E is other. Please specify so you can leave uh, another answer in there. And as they're getting those together, I thought we'd talk a little bit more about um, what you've done in your seafaring life, David. Apparently you're an avid kayaker, I've said it before. What's the most extreme place you've ventured out in a kayak? Yeah, one good example, we were uh, actually making our way back from Perth, so we lived there in 2012, and we had a kayak on the roof driving across the Nullarbor, which looked uh, a little bit silly at times, uh, but we did manage to jump in at Esperance, and um, yeah, it was, it was a good lesson in that uh, southern coast of WA, and we got schooled. Um, <laughs> so we pushed out, my wife and I, in our double kayak, uh, and she's not great with the seasickness, so we were, we were pushing the margins on this one. 
Uh, and sure enough, uh, she was sick on this occasion. Uh, and we managed to push around a headland and we, we weren't going to get back into where we launched from. So we had to um, basically find a different cove to pull into. Um, and it was, it was pretty interesting surfing the waves in on that occasion. Um, I think the swell was probably around about one to two metres, but by the time they get close to the coast, we were feeling it. Um, <laughs> so we managed to you know, land on the beach fairly safely and left the kayak there and walked our way back to where we stood in and uh, picked up the car and drove back and picked it up. That was <laughs> quite an experience, that one. I'm guessing it was a very quiet trip across the Nullar Wall. It was a bit quieter after that one, yeah. yeah. Uh, seeing all the kangaroos on the beach, that was pretty cool. Oh, that is cool. cool. That would be amazing. So, I'm sorry, I did miss one of the options, D sailboat as well. So, um, we'll wrap up that poll in just a second, but we did get a couple of questions uh, that have come through already. Uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen sorry, has asked, does the East Coast current get affected by the seasons? Yeah, it certainly strengthens up. Um, it's, it's really about the temperature ultimately that drives that current uh, and the winds that force the ocean. Um, so there will be variation season to season in the strength of that current. Um, and that feeds back as well in terms of waves that are moving through from, say, a southerly direction, going against the Estes Radian current, which comes down from the north. Um, you can get quite steep waves in certain parts where that current's very strong. Uh, that's, a, that's a real hazard off the east coast there. Okay, we'll be, we'll be looking at our ocean current forecast later on today. Oh, fantastic. Okay, well, we're going to wrap up the poll now. Um, if you uh, had a question that you wanted to ask, like Stephen, he got his one in nice and early, feel free to uh, send it in via the chat right now. We'd love to hear a little bit more about you. As those uh, numbers are being collated, uh, we actually have a question from David. How does one read cloud formations to understand impending weather at sea? Yeah, there's, there's lots of different types of clouds. So we, um, we have some explainers on our website, which are really good to refer to, uh, and also on our Ask Bomb video, which talks about the different cloud types, the names that we give them, the different levels, uh, and the weather associated with them. So we're going to talk a little bit about thunderstorms in this particular webinar. Uh, but if you've got additional questions about how to interpret clouds, I'd recommend going and looking at that resource uh, after this webinar. Excellent. Okay, so the results, I believe you have there, David? I don't have them on my oh, screen. <laughs> my mistake. All right, we will uh, endeavour to get those um, results to you as soon as possible. All right, so moving on. Now we know a little bit more about your vessel and what you use. Uh, let's talk. Let's get into about how to read the weather for when you use it. Lucy, you'll be starting this off today. Yes. Yes. So let's get stuck into our scenario. And really, what we're covering today covers no matter what type of. Um, you know, answer that pe people previously just responded to. We're talking maybe a bit more um, about a scenario where we're going to pretend that you're going out on a sailing trip, Jordan. Oh. <laughs> um, so we've got a whole range of coastal waters areas that cover all around Australia. Today we'll cover a scenario where you'll be travelling in the Coffs Coast on the New South Wales coastline. You used to live there, lovely area. Yep. Um, so yeah, we're going to pretend that you're going to go on a trip and we'll look at the tools that we've got to get you ready to head out. Uh, yep. Cool. All right, so the first thing that's worth looking at when you're trying to understand what's happening with the weather is these weather maps. Um, probably seen them on the TV most nights, so it's a, uh, a common feature there. Um, just a quick sort of overview of these maps. We can have them as either analysis, so looking at the past weather. It's a, a good way to summarise what's been happening in the weather. But also we can look at, at them in a forecast sense. So this is actually a, a forecast or a prognosis. And we're going to be looking at this particular day a couple of weeks ago, Saturday the 25th, 25th of January. Um, and here's the mean sea level pressure chart, we call it, uh, for 10 a.m. on that day. And this is a forecast. So some of the main features we pick out here, um, basically it's representing the way the air flows around, uh, certainly at the surface in the atmosphere. Um, and you can see way south of Australia, we've got quite a few of those black lines punching up. The isobar is very tight, so we'd expect very strong winds down there. Um, we also see features like these H and L, the highs and lows, um, areas of high and low pressure, which typically the highs are associated with fairly stable conditions and lighter winds, uh, especially near the centre of it. Um, and the lows quite often are associated with unstable conditions, so thunderstorms and showers. And for our particular point or area of interest, which is northeast New South Wales, you can see there is a trough extending through that part of the world um, on this forecast Saturday. So that will be something for us to look out for in the forecast. But generally, if we look at the flow around the system, so there's a high pressure which is just, just off the map there to uh, the east over near New Zealand. Uh, and we would expect the winds to flow anti-clockwise, or they do flow anti-clockwise around a high pressure system in the southern hemisphere. 
And as a result, you can imagine the wind flowing around, similar to these green lines, are sort of an easterly out over the, the southern Coral Sea, uh, and northerly throughout part of the world, so northeast New South Wales. And then we would expect it to wrap around that trough and come in on the coast there as some sort of easterly. So that's generally the pattern that we're expecting uh, for our particular forecast day. And this is really handy to get an overview of what's happening. Um, but we also have an interpretation of that at the top of each of our coastal waters forecasts. So you can see the weather situation here, and they say, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, so the picture is really good. But if the picture is pretty complicated or you can't quite understand that, then you can always refer to these words, which basically describe all those um, key big drivers uh, that are affecting the, the forecast area at that particular time. Um, so, yes, not going to read through that, but that's worth referring to to get the big picture of what's going on. Excellent. Um, before we keep going, we do have the poll results now, and uh, a, re a resounding amount of you uh, are sailboat people, or sailors, I guess, you would put that. Um, so thank you for participating in that poll, and we will have another one uh, to find out a little bit more about your habits later on. That's, That's perfect. You must have the poll too then, George. <laughs> um, so we'll start working through the different parts of the coastal waters forecast. And I should have emphasised at the start that we're working through a scenario based around the Saturday 25th of January. So this was two weeks ago over the long weekend, um, which we, we picked out as a scenario to build on. So it's, it's not the forecast for this coming up weekend, which um, you'll probably realise because the forecast, um, yeah, lots of warnings going on there at, this, at, the moment, at the moment. So yes, yeah, so let's continue on. Um, with the wind, which is the first part of the coastal waters forecast, you can see the descriptions that for northerly 15 to 20 knot winds. So the thing that we want to emphasise with our wind speed forecast is that they're averages. When um, you're on the water, what you experience is a sequence of gusts and lulls. And what, when we provide the forecast, that's measured at a 10 minute period at a height of 10 metres above sea level. So we do that so that it corresponds with the way winds are measured and observed at weather stations where the, the wind anemometer is at 10 metres above sea level. So what you should be expecting is that gusts can be up to 40% stronger than what's forecast there. So in this case, we've got a forecast up to 20 knots winds, which means you might want to be expecting gusts of up to around 28 knots. Uh, so potentially for some of the smaller sailboats, this might already be too strong. It's, it's sort of, um, you know, we emphasize on, on the uh, skipper to know their restraints of their vessel. Um, but this is a useful guide to know what you should expect um, to get to suit the ability of your, your vessel and, and your own skills. Yeah, and with both the winds and the waves, it's worth keeping in mind these are quite large areas. So it's a good planning tool, this forecast, um, to just see that the broader conditions, we'll talk about MEDI a little bit further in the slide deck, but that's how you can drill into a bit more detail. So let's have a look at the next component. So this is our sea and swell forecast. So basically the sea states, combination of different types of waves. Um, we break it down into two aspects. The first one is the sea, which as you can see for our scenario, we've got one to two metre waves, which are decreasing a bit during the morning. And we have a swell which is coming from the east to northeast at around one metre. Uh, also worth noting with both the winds, the sea and the swell, or, sorry, not the sea, but the swell, uh, wherever we talk about direction, it's where it's coming from. So if you're trying to think about the wind direction, you face straight into the wind, whatever direction you're facing is where the wind is coming from. That's our convention for both forecasting and for the observations. Mm. Dave, can you explain why sometimes in a the forecast there are two swells listed? Yeah, so sometimes we actually have two distinct swells, so they can be coming from quite different directions and both be fairly significant. Uh, in that case, we'll actually mention it as a first swell and a second swell. Uh, really important because where you've got swells that are crossing from quite different directions, it can lead to a fairly chaotic sea state uh, and can be quite a safety concern, especially if you're in a small vessel. So when you say swell one and swell two, are they graded? Do you put number one because it's the most extreme or is it just what happens, like you do the north first or the south first? Yeah, it's a good question with a somewhat complicated answer, which we'll come back to a bit later. <laughs> okay, sticking with the text forecast though, um, so we'll get this one set, it does mention them in order of height. So the first swell will be the higher of the two swells for that particular coastal water zone, and the second swell will then be the second most uh, significant wave. Okay. Yeah. It's different in Medi, and we'll come back to that. Good question. Okay, so let's get into this in a little bit more detail. So what does sea and swell actually mean? So uh, we break it down into these components for, for ease and for safety ultimately. Um, but when we're talking about sea, we're talking about the locally generated waves. So that's, um, you know, basically the ocean is responding to that stress induced by the winds that are moving across it. Um, so that could just be the general flow uh, of the atmosphere across the ocean. It could be a sea breeze, so a very localised sort of effect. 
Uh, it could be a thunderstorm that's whipped up, which is kind of like this image here. Um, so these seas are typically quite choppy. Um, they can be very steep and uh, sort of a short duration. So they, you know, the, the crests of the waves are coming through very uh, frequently. And they can also come from a broad range of directions. Um, so as I say, they're very chaotic. Uh, we often see the sort of white capping with it as those waves break. Um, in our case study, because we've got these northerly winds, we would expect most of those wind waves or the sea to be coming from the north as well. Um, so if we're looking for some shelter from both the wind and the waves for our case study, uh, it'd be worth us trying to find a south-facing coastline or at least you know, finding a bit of shelter from that uh, full exposure to the north. Um, I guess a fairly relatable example for, for seas is you might go out in the morning um, out to the coast, you have a look out and it's fairly flat and glassy. Um, often that's the case in the morning, you don't have particularly strong winds and then in the afternoon it picks up with a sea breeze. Um, so in the afternoon you would expect in that case it to be quite sort of choppy and see lots of those white caps and, and the waves pushing in up onto the coast. So that's how we can kind of um, interpret the, the seas in that way. Um, and would you say that Jordan in his sailboat should be concerned about both the sea and the swell? He should be concerned about both. Uh, I guess it depends on the size of the vessel as to which one's going to affect you more. Um, so I guess the, the recommendation is definitely check both. Um, but it can be quite often that the seas, are, as I say, because they're very frequent and uh, they're quite steep waves, it can pose a bit of a cat-sized risk for very small vessels. Um, mm -hmm. So definitely worth watching out for that one. Okay, so the other component is the swell. So um, as we've spoken about, we can have a couple of swell components mentioned in our forecast. Um, swells are much longer periods, so that's the time between each crest uh, of each wave. Um, they're far more regular, uh, they move in much more sort of uniform uh, wave fronts. Um, swell energy is really hard to forecast just by looking at a map because you've got to think about uh, very distant sources of swell generation. So for, say, Australia, Southern Ocean is a common uh, place for swell generation. It can generate down in the Southern Ocean with, you know, gale force, storm force winds, and it can take multiple days to get to your particular coastline of interest. So there's no way really to look at that you know, it's a snapshot in time and say, based on this forecast wind pattern, I expect the swell to be this. So it's really important to refer to the forecast, which takes into account lots of the modelling and the transport of that wave energy throughout the ocean. Um, and that's really the only way to find information about what swell you're expecting for your coastline. Speaking of, of forecasting and making sure that you keep up to date with it, and I know we'll be going into this in more detail, um, John, he said that with stable conditions in the forecast can be reliable several days ahead, but then with more complex weather systems, there's obviously greater uncertainty. Um, how can we work out how confident to be in the forecast moving forward when you say, oh, we want to do this in some time? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think um, generally speaking, where we've got fairly slow moving weather patterns and we've got large areas of high pressure, for example, uh, we don't expect large changes from day to day in the forecast. Whereas when we've got things like a cut-off low pressure system or an east coast low or a tropical cyclone or some other feature uh, which is affecting, you know, potentially a very small or a large area, um, but it's, it's changing from one forecast to the next, you really want to stay, uh, you know, up to date with the latest forecast because it can change quite dramatically uh, in terms of, say, the track of a tropical cyclone. Um, and so you want to be on top of that. Okay. The final component then in our CM12, we can put it all together basically in this thing called the total wave height. Uh, we also talk about this as the significant wave height. Um, and that's really just putting together the sea and up to two swell components. Now, it's not a direct addition of those two wave heights or those three wave heights, um, but we do provide that uh, total wave height as a forecast parameter on the MEDI, which we'll be showing just in a few slides at the time as well. Mm. Yeah, and I'll just add to that um, when we're talking about the total wave height, which is also known as the significant wave height. Um, as they've already mentioned, that the wave forecast heights are an average. So we use this graphic to demonstrate that what you might experience most frequently are the smaller waves. What we forecast is a significant wave, um, which we describe as being, like, yeah, that's the average height of the highest one third of the waves. Um, otherwise, the average wave height would be quite small in the forecast. So that's, we yeah, forecast the significant or total wave height. Um, and that's why we also describe in our forecast that you should expect waves up to twice the height. Um, so yeah, I think in our forecast of wave heights of about two metres, you should be expecting a maximum wave of about four metres. Right, so let's keep going on to our scenario. The last component of the coastal waters forecast is the weather section. 
This gives you a general description of the cloud cover, the likelihood of rainfall for the area, um, as well as any indicators of reduced visibility. So that might be the um, chance of fog, um, or in this case, the chance of a thunderstorm, which you could then um, associate with maybe either lightning or some hail. Um, and I think, Dave, you're going to tell us a bit more about thunderstorms. Yeah, thunderstorms are pretty interesting. It certainly pose uh, quite a few hazards for mariners. So worth us focusing on. The first one, just to highlight, um, as shown in this image, that you can get quite strong, gusty, squally type winds out of thunderstorms. So um, basically, as the rain falls through, say a decent shower or thunderstorm, all of that air kind of gets pushed out around it when it hits the surface of the ocean. Um, and that results in these strong and gusty winds that can come from any direction, depending on where that thunderstorm has actually formed. Um, so that's where it's a bit tricky. You might have a forecast you know, that's, that's talking about northerly winds, but if the thunderstorm forms to the, the south of you, the outflow comes from the south and catches you off guard. So really important to uh, stay attuned to what's happening around you when you actually get out on the water, and particularly if we do have thunderstorms mentioned on our forecast, um, so just be wary of that as well. So you can see in this image here, you've got a couple of sailboats around that thunderstorm, the, the cartoon thunderstorm there. Um, and, you know, you don't want to have the wrong sail up at this time because uh, you're going to cop it. Um, and also, there's just really a, that capsized risk with really strong, squally winds that you weren't otherwise expecting. So it's you know, important to stay on top of thunderstorms. Dave, what would you recommend if people are actually out on the water and are trying, if they've maybe heard um, in a forecast or over the radio that there's a thunderstorm developing, what should they be looking out for? Yeah, so typically when you're actually out there, you'll see the thunderstorm start as very um, high, what we call towering cumulus, so it's the, the puffy sort of clouds. Um, so when you get those developing and getting quite a decent vertical extent in the atmosphere, they may turn into thunderstorms, they may not, but that's certainly the precursor to be looking out for. So if you do see those signs, it's worth um, you know, tuning into the radio and trying to get some more information. If you've got a mobile signal, you can check, out, uh, check the radar and check the, the warnings. Um, but certainly, if you're, if you're unsure, it's worth kind of getting back closer to coast uh, in case that thunderstorm does develop. Yeah, I guess a couple of other phenomena of interest with thunderstorms. So you might uh, see hail. That would be, you know, Ooh. pretty scary, especially if it's large hail out on the water. Um, reduced visibility. Uh, so really heavy showers can reduce that visibility. Uh, and also lightning. You don't want to be stuck out, you know, a lightning uh, sort of thunderstorm. So. Um, otherwise, you might just get quite wet and cold quickly. Yeah, that's what comes <laughs> on well, we're edging closer to our uh, hypothetical trip, um, but before we get fully uh, on the water and cast off, let's do another poll and uh, get to a few questions. So if you do have a question, please pop it in the, uh, in the uh, text box now. Now, our next poll is about your habits when you're on your vessel. We'd like to know where you travel on a typical trip. Do you A, stay in sheltered bays, B, go inland on rivers or lakes, C, go to the open ocean but stay within sight of land, D, go to the open ocean beyond the sight of land, not for me, and E, something else. What else? If you have something else, just pop it in there uh, and we will uh, get to it um, as soon as we can. So let's start that poll now. Um, while we're waiting for the results of the poll, we did get some interesting questions from um, our registration. And John, he asked, and this is something I have never really thought of until he mentioned it. Do weather patterns travel the same over land as they do when they get to the water? Um, and maybe you could shed some light on that. Yeah, there's a few different aspects of ways to answer this question. I guess one recent example we saw was Tropical Cyclone Damien uh, off the northwest of Australia. Now it came down and affected through the Pilbara Coast type region. Um, it, when it hits the land, there's a lot more friction that that system encounters. Uh, and then as, as a result, we typically see this, that it decays fairly rapidly. Um, so that's where an example of basically the tropical cyclone needs to keep feeding off the really warm water as it stays out over the ocean and various other conditions that will favour its development and, uh, and intensification. But when it does encounter that land, this is just an example, a lot more friction when it gets over the land than over the water. So you would expect uh, the surface winds to encounter that friction and slow down, and as a result, the system starts to break down. Um, similar sorts of effects, so say we, when you've got a, a decent cold front moving around through the southeast of Australia, um, it can move very quickly up, say, the east coast of Australia with things like a southerly buster. People might have heard of that term. Um, really strong, gusty winds that move up the coast, and it's basically the cold front wrapping around quickly 
um, as it moves quicker over the water. Uh, whereas quite often they stall up in the, um, the great dividing range. So in the higher terrain, a lot more friction uh, and the systems take a lot longer to push through that part of the world. So yeah, you do get those differences. Okay, that's really interesting. Um, we did get um, some more uh, questions that have come through and please, uh, like we said, keep adding those questions once you've filled out your poll. Uh, now John, he's asked, with, the, uh, with one in seven waves are highest, um, oh wait, sorry, uh, is there a table, this is from Richard, for combining sea and swells on the BOM website? And if not, why is there not a combined sea state in the forecast? Yeah, so we, we will be covering that to some extent. Uh, we do have a table on our website which we can um, provide a link to at the end of the presentation where you can do that calculation. Like David said, it's not a one-to-one. -one. You can't just add the two together and generate your total wave height. Um, so we have a, a way to help you do that on, on our website. But as we're going to get into MedEye, we do provide the total wave height, so you don't need to do that calculation yourself. Um, okay. Within the text forecast, we provide the seas and swells partitioned in that way so that people with different types of um, boats or uh, yeah, activities on the water can understand the different impacts um, for their particular activity. Okay. And as we wrap up the poll, um, we've also got another question that's coming through from Owen. Now, does the barometer impact on sea level? So a low pressure reduces the sea level and therefore impacts on ocean currents? Yeah, it certainly does affect um, the, the sea level um, to, to an extent. So in that local area, you do get what we call the inverse barometer effect. Um, so basically, you have this reduced surface pressure or reduced um, pressure of the atmosphere down on the ocean allows the ocean to actually rise up a little bit. Um, it's not the largest component of a storm surge, but it is a component that we uh, consider in, in forecasting storm surge. Okay. I always remember, and for people who grew up in Sydney, they'll know about this, there was um, Tim Bailey used to be on the uh, weather and he would always go, Bailey's barometer. Yes, yes. And ever since then, I've always wanted to know what a barometer does. <laughs> what he described, I don't think that was actually what it did. Um, so we've completed our poll uh, looking at where you travel when you go on a typical trip. And overwhelmingly, people like to go to the open ocean, um, but stay within sight of land. So interesting. Right. Is there anything, if someone is, and I know we'll probably go into this a little bit more in detail, but the difference in planning for going to open ocean to staying inside must be quite vast, right? Yeah, it's a good question. We do have certain different products depending on what your activity is. Certainly if you're going really far offshore and you, you know, extending even beyond the extent of Menai, which cuts off at 60 nautical miles, we've got high seas forecasts, which a lot of, you know, the shipping industry would be using. Closer into shore, for example, the people that um, said maybe they do kayaking or you know activities that maybe closer into shore. Uh, we also have local waters forecast, which are at all the capital city waterways, um, which have many of the similar uh, forecast elements that you should be pre preparing for. And when we get into Medi, that's got the more detailed localized forecast as well. Again, that's going to be more suitable for watercraft that aren't going travelling as far distances. Um, we've got some, again, materials on our website that are useful for those specific activities. We've um, written a blog recently about kayaking and paddling and knowing the weather for, the, for those activities. So we'd recommend reading through that and finding out about some of the additional things we have, like stream flow forecasts that might be relevant for those activities. Okay, fantastic. Well, we are still open for your questions, so keep sending them through. But uh, we are getting closer to our hypothetical trip. Lucy, what do we need to do next? Okay. So let's move up to the day before we're planning um, for you to head out, Jordan. And looking again at the forecast, not a lot has changed, so we are probably looking at one of those more stable weather patterns that Dave was talking about. Um, well, it's important, as we've sort of already talked about, to get into that behaviour of checking again with, um, with the forecast in case things have, have changed. We update the forecast at least twice a day. Um, as a general rule, they're issued in the morning. Um, say around like 4 or 5 a.m. and then update it again in the afternoon. In the forecast, it does say the when it was issued and then when you can also expect it to next be updated so you can anticipate when that will happen. They then get updated even more frequently if there's a warning current. So now that we are sort of within that, say, 24-hour period, um, there could be warnings potentially that have been issued where we issue warnings from about 42 hours in advance. So in this case, there aren't any, so that's that's a good sign. Um, and certainly you can see that the winds are below that, that threshold, which would trigger a strong wind warning. 
Um, there's just a bit of additional detail there in the weather section about areas of fog inshore. So, yeah, as we've talked about, reduced visibility can, can be a hazard, so that's useful um, to be planning ahead for. So if we do have a warning, uh, just remind us how it appears at the top of the forecast there. Yeah, so for every day, um, because they're, they're current from midnight to midnight, um, they would pop up for each day between where you see the date and then the wind section. Um, you can also view the warnings um, for all of the coastal waters areas for your state on the website. So even though it's got a, you know, there might be a warning for this Saturday, it might only be coming into uh, effect, or, or those conditions might only really come into effect at the end of the day. So you might have, you know, 15 to 20 knot winds during most part of the day, and then mm -hmm. during the evening it might be increasing to say 20 to 30 knots, and that's the time at which you'd have that sort of um, hazardous yeah. condition. Yeah. That's a great segue, actually, because we're going to start talking about some more detailed forecasts where you can see those changes during the day. So let's get into MetEye. And for those who haven't used MetEye before, this is one of the sections of our website where you can view the forecast in a graphical way. So it's the same data that's used to generate the text forecast, but then represented um, on a map throughout Australia. And it's a gridded forecast. So you've got forecast data for every six kilometre square um, on the land and then over the water out to 60 nautical miles. So let's start looking at some of the more um, yeah, detailed elements. You can, you can search for your location at the top there or you can just scroll around and look for your location. Um, also useful that you can see three hourly blocks forecast. So as Dave was saying, if there's a warning um, that maybe the strong winds aren't coming through till later in the day, you'll be able to see that as you progress through the, the forecast throughout the day. Um, another thing to point out is that the forecast winds on MedEye will display a knot, which is again correlating to uh, the wind speeds in the text forecast. So it's important to be, if you're comparing different products, that you're looking at wind speeds in knots. Um, and then we've got our colour scale there on the right, which will give an indication of the strength of those winds. So Ross has uh, just asked, is there an app for MedEye or is it only on PC? And since we're talking about MedEye, I thought it would be the perfect chance mm. um, in case you are in front of your computer or phone right now that you could load it up and have a go. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, it is a web page, so it's not an app. Um, benefit is obviously that means it's completely free um, and easy to use. We are in the process of uh, redesigning our website, which will inc include uplifting these types of products so that they're more um, convenient to use on mobile phones and tablets. Um, so we've definitely had some feedback that people find Meta hard to use because there's a lot of information um, that's hard mm. to fit onto a small screen. But um, yeah, we know that people love using it, so we're we're hopefully working towards it being uh, easy to use on mobile phones, in particular in the future. Yeah, I, I've played around with this um, before, you know, and it, I think it's very obvious to everyone that I do not go on boats that often unless they're ferries. Uh, and the level of detail that's on there, putting well, squeezing all that into an app. I, uh, I really feel for the developer there because that's going to be pretty difficult. Sure. <laughs> right now, there's a ton of information on there. And like you said, that grid extends 60 nautical miles off the coast of Australia and throughout Australia entirely. It's amazing. Yeah, there's lots of detail there. Um, so we'll look at the wind forecast for that Saturday afternoon. Um, and we've kind of circled the area that we uh, think that you're planning on heading out toward. Maybe you're sailing up to the South Solitary Islands for the day. Ooh. Um, and you can see here that the winds in early afternoon have got that sort of southerly trend closer towards the coast and sort of further south of the Coffs Coast area. Um, but there's still some the, the sort of prevailing northerly winds um, in the majority of, of the area. And that then later in the afternoon, those northerly winds are prevailing. So maybe you'll have um, some northerly winds on your trip, trip back home from the, from the islands. And just linking this back actually to our mean sea level pressure chart that we spoke about before, we, uh, I identified that there was a trough expected to be throughout sort of um, coastal forecast zone. And so we were expecting those north, northeasterly winds to the northern part of our area of interest. But at some point around that trough axis, the, the winds would come more as a sort of onshore easterly or southeasterly. And we can see that here in the forecast. But that would definitely be something to look out for. Um, before you actually head out, because the, the position of that trough may change on the day. Uh, it can be a fairly subtle feature as to where that sets up. So we'll talk about it in a few slides, but you know, looking at the actual observations at the time and being aware of those sorts of features and how the forecast is comparing to grounds, basically the, the conditions on the ground, uh, is really important as well. But this is just the day before that we're looking at in our forecast. 
And going on then to the wave component. So again, the day before, we're having a look at the forecast. We've just picked this one time step, so that's at 8 a.m. on the Saturday. Basically, it's probably the time you're going to push out after a bit of a sleeping. Sure. Well, yeah, if anyone knows me, <laughs> that's happening. I am the sleeping. Very good. <laughs> um, so, in terms of waves, there are a few components, again, much like we have in the text forecast. So, uh, the first one we'll look at here is the wind wave. Basically, this is going to be tied to our wind forecast. Um, so, we derive this based on the forecast winds. Um, and that's one component which doesn't have a direction attached to it, but as I said, most of the waves, most of these wind waves or seas will come from the same sort of direction as the wind. So we would expect most of these waves to be coming from a sort of northerly direction. Um, and you can see there from the colour scale that the waves are a bit bigger offshore than as we get closer to the coast. So picking up that sort of detail is really valuable. That's the first component. Second component that we'll look at here is called the total wave height. This is where it puts together the wind wave or the seas and the swell and potentially a swell too as well, depending on which components you're in play. Um, now the important thing here is this is the total sea state. This is probably the first thing you want to look at as the, the sort of filter. Um, it gives you, as you can see, the colour palette, again, the wave heights, but also you have arrows over the top. So the arrows correspond to your two swell groups or up to two swell groups. And you can see in the sort of Byron Coast area, we just have one swell group in play, which is the east northeasterly. And further south, we've actually got a southerly swell as well. So this is through the Coffs Harbour area. We've got the easterly and the southerly. Um, now, the size of the arrows on Medi here is basically conveying the relative uh, or height or significance of those two wave groups. So we can then drill down in further detail by going into the swell one and the swell two components. Now, these basically, these wave components have been reorganised by the Bureau's forecasters um, to adhere to a directional so we try and keep it consistent across borders, so between states um, and also from day to day, such that just taking again our, our area of interest, um, swell one will capture any of the swell that's coming up from the south and sort of southeasterly direction, whereas swell two will capture anything that's coming from the east or the northeast. And that keeps things nice and consistent across the whole coastline. Now that's an important point because when I said in the text forecast it mentions the most significant or the highest swell first, it could actually be that the swell two is mentioned first in the text forecast, and then the swell one is mentioned second. So it does reverse the order in the text forecast compared to what Medi says. And the takeaway point there is that you need to look at both swell components when it comes to looking at Medi. So there's our total wave height with the two arrows, but we then have to drill down and look at the components. And when we look at swell one, you can see it's that southerly swell, which is not very significant at all in this case, uh, but still you know, worth taking note of. And it's the swell too, which is the more energetic. So that's the east northeast blue swell uh, in this case. Another useful feature of MedEye that I think we should point out here is uh, the fact that you can click on any point on the map to get more detail. So when you're looking at the colour scale, it will group wave heights or wind speeds into groups like groups of, um, you know, whether it's 0 0.5 to 1 metres. But if you actually click on this, um, the area of the map that you're interested in, you'll get a pop-up that will show you some more detail. And you can expand that to then see the precise wind speeds or wave heights down to that nearest decimal point um, or round to, to the nearest knot. Um, and you can also then, if you click on the, the top right, see text views for location, that will then open up a window that's the, the text or the table view of MedEye for that location. So again, you can just see those three hourly forecasts with the more pre, um, precise or exact um, wave and wind measurements, which is useful if you're really after that level of detail. So let's continue on. Um, when we're talking about our five vital weather safety checks, one of the other things we recommend doing is checking the tides. And we probably don't have a lot of time today to get into detail about tides. There's a lot of um, yeah, phenomena associated with tides which we could probably get into in a, an entirely separate webinar on its own. Um, but for today, we'll just recommend Checking um, the title predictions on our website, we've got over 380 locations where you can get the um, tide heights, the times of the high and low tides um, for your nearest tidal station. Um, in general, this is kind of useful to know whether or not you can get access in and out of a harbour or uh, for planning the, a safe time to be doing a bar or a sandbar crossing, for example. Um, but again, yeah, useful to go into this um, into more detail maybe in a future chance. So let's move ahead to on the day. So it's the day that you're planning to go out, Jordan. Finally. <laughs> let's check in with the forecast again and just double check that things are still looking good for you to go. 
Um, so we can see for the winds, it's again still sort of tending northerly 15, 20 knots. Um, we've got some detail there about the, those southerly inshore winds um, until the middle of the day, which, which is good to know. And um, yeah, otherwise the season swell and weather, we're still, it's still looking the same. So, so far maybe your plan's down, still okay. On the day, we probably would like to also start looking at some real-time weather observations. So the Bureau's got a network of automatic weather stations. Um, we have a section of a website for coastal observations where we've grouped together the ones that are along the coast or some of the ones like beacons that are actually out on the water that will give you those observations that are most representative of what you should be expecting out on the water. Um, so here we've got a sample of um, the one at Coffs Harbour Airport and then those ones um, heading up north of the coast. So you can see maybe how those wind um, trends are happening, whether if there's a cold front moving through, it's useful to identify sort of where it's already come through um, because the stations are ordered um, along the coastline so you can see that trend occurring. Um, this is then generally useful for you to, to verify if what you'd planned um, and what you have looked at in the forecast is all still tracking and you can go ahead with the plans or if you maybe need to make a few changes. Um, these observations are updated every, at least every half hour, sometimes more frequently. We have rules to update the observations um, much more frequently in high impact situations. For example, if there's a squall, you might get you know, observations every minute um, to be tracking those, those really peak gusts. Um, you can also then select any of those individual stations to get a breakdown of all the observations for that particular station. Okay, another useful observational tool that I'm sure many of our watchers are very familiar with is our rain radar. The snapshots of the day of the scenario that we're, we're working towards, not too much rain activity down near Coffs Harbour, it's all happening a bit further up north. Um, so I've grabbed a screenshot of a different day just to give an indication of what it looks like when there is rain on the rain radar. Um, so that's useful to see where those, um, the rainfall or storms potentially are occurring. Um, so that's in the, sort of the last few minutes, um, updated every six minutes. And there's also a really great feature where you can switch on the weather observations, which I've got circled there at the bottom right, so that you can view the wind speeds and wind gusts at all, at all of our weather stations in the area. Okay. And lastly, just another tool that uh, might be useful, particularly for those going sailing um, and that might get uh, yeah, more, more affected by the ocean currents. We have seven day ocean current forecasts on our website, uh, which they're forecast for each day and you can just see the, the strength of the currents in knots and see what direction they're trending in. Um, this is going to be particularly uh, important if you're maybe trying to head north against that, that strong southerly current along um, the east coast there. So again, just a useful tool to, to be at your disposal. All right, fantastic. Well, I feel very confident that I can take my imaginary boat out now. Oh, good. Uh, we do have um, some allotted time now for questions. We would love to hear um, any questions that you have. It's not very often that you get to sit down with two experts of the Bureau and find out anything to do with uh, marine um, situations or taking your boat out. So uh, we do have some that have come through during the uh, presentation. Ronald, he's asked a little bit more about MetEye, so I thought we'd cover that before we get into some of the other general questions. He wanted to know, is there a way that you can save your preferences on MetEye so you can always uh, go back there whenever you load it up so you don't have to keep putting in the details of mm. where you want to go? Yeah, it's great feedback. I don't believe it does, but that's definitely something that we're taking into consideration as we're building the new version of the website, which we would definitely want to incorporate those types of features. Excellent. Um, Nick has asked a question, and it's kind of blown my mind, so maybe you can help me out with this, because I didn't know that this was true. Uh, he said, why are they called thunderstorms when at sea you cannot hear the thunder? Only see the storm. Is that true? Can you not hear thunder in the ocean? It depends how close you are to it, I guess. Um, I mean, it's possible that you can see a thunderstorm off in the distance and the flashing lightning and you just can't hear it. Um, that would be true over, over both land and water, but from my own experience and 
there's no reason to, to say otherwise. But um, certainly if you're close enough to it, you'll see it and you'll hear it. Okay. Yeah. If right. you're close enough, you'll feel it. Hopefully it's not too close. Now, John's asked a question that I think everyone gets a little bit frustrated about when they see a forecast, when it says the chance of a thunderstorm. Now, what probability are we actually talking about here? Yes, we actually put um, the, the chance of thunderstorm. It's, it's a difficult thing to forecast, I guess, at the heart of it. So um, thunderstorms typically pop up uh, sporadically in, in an area. Um, so it's hard to say precisely, say, for a grid cell or um, even for a coastal water zone sometimes, whether you will or won't get thunderstorms. Um, so typically we, we flag it as a potential risk to look out for. Um, and then it's really about monitoring it on the day, as I was saying before. Okay. Yeah, it's essentially a prompt to be checking, tuning in to the radio if you're out on the water for any warnings. Um, and certainly if you're on land or within mobile coverage, be checking the warnings for any thunderstorm warnings. Over those capital city local waters areas that I mentioned before, we provide cell thunderstorm warnings, which will like, show you the actual movement um, of the thunderstorm cell as it's potentially passing over a waterway. So they're the best thing to be looking at if you think that it's, um, yeah, if you're anticipating a thunderstorm in your area. Okay. Euro, uh, and I really hope I've pronounced that right. I'm sorry if I've got your name wrong. Uh, they've asked, why did Lake Entrance have an abnormally low, low tide? this week. I don't know if that's something you can answer, but I just thought it was kind of interesting. That is a, a good question and maybe that's one that we might um, suggest if you can submit that one to us at our email address that we've provided at the end. Um, we'll ask our title experts to get back to you on that one. Excellent. Uh, Margaret, she says, what is a squeeze zone, Thomas Valentine's Day, and what are the implications for a sailboat? I'm not familiar with that term. Uh, I don't know if you can describe what the effect is. It okay. sounds like maybe it's to do with air pressure, but I am not familiar with the term. Well, Margaret, if you're, if you're still there, please tell us a little bit more about a, a squeeze zone where we're a little bit in the dark about what that actually means. Um, so we've got a question from Peter. He said, a somewhat off topic, but Point Wilson, Victoria weather station, Will it be repaired or replaced? And if so, it's the timeline. Now, I know that is that is a question that we bring up because we do have an email that you can send those kind of questions to if you do have one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, we love getting feedback from the public and um, definitely send it through. Um, we, as I said, we've got a, a whole network of weather stations that we're constantly in the process of maintaining. Um, we have a whole observation program here that, that, that coordinates that, so I can definitely follow up on that one. Um, the email address is customerservice at bomb.gov.au. Yeah, any of those really specific questions that we can't really answer for you right now, we'll, if you send them to that email address, we'll be able to answer them uh, in the future. We've uh, got an interesting uh, question from Tim. He said, are there any recommendations for lightning tracking or prediction websites? Is there something on the bomb for that or are there other resources out there that we can track Lightning? Mm, I'd be recommending the Satellite Viewer. What do you think, Dave? Yeah, the Satellite Viewer has a layer which is uh, accessible down the bottom left. And you can click on the lightning tracking layer there and that will show you where the current and recent lightning strikes have been detected. Um, in terms of forecasting, really it's about where are the thunderstorms forecast to go, um, tracking it on radar. So if it's happening at the moment, you can keep an eye on the radar and see when you get really high what we call reflectivity returns, the really dark colours, the, the reds and the blacks. That's when you're starting to get towards uh, very heavy rainfall rates, which typically are associated with the core of a thunderstorm. Um, and that's where you might start to see uh, lightning as well. No guarantee, but you, you're most likely to see it there. So those would be the things I'd recommend watching out for, as well as the warnings associated uh, with thunderstorms. Now, this is, again, off topic, but we've got this question, and there's no better person to answer this than uh, you, David. This is from Martin. He said, does BOM issue tsunami alerts? Yeah, we certainly do. Yeah, it's probably a separate webinar again because it's quite a big topic. Um, so I guess in short, we have um, a tsunami warning service that we operate for uh, Australia and we also provide uh, advice to the Indian Ocean countries. Um, and that was set up after the Indian Ocean uh, tsunami in 2004. Um, there are different levels of warnings and you can find more information on our website about that. Um, yeah, it's, it's probably a good topic for a separate webinar. Okay, and just for people who uh, may not have remembered, can you describe a little bit about your work with tsunamis here at Bond? 
Yeah, so um, I also work across uh, so both marine and the tsunami warning service, and a lot of it's focused on training our in-service staff to provide those warning services. All right. Graham has asked, um, so he does ocean races. Um, MedEye is really helpful for anticipating isolated low-pressure systems, but he's asked, can I download more detailed MSLP diagrams than the one that displays all of Australia? Hmm. Um, I would be recommending trying out Marine Light, which is uh, a separate part on our website which we've designed for use on satellite phones um, or if you're in low bandwidth areas and you want something that's quick to load on a phone um, and those charts you can definitely download. So on Marine Light we provide all of the coastal waters forecasts, all of the wind, wind warnings um, and then there's also a selection of weather charts and the MSLP or the um, air pressure charts are one of those. So you can, you can download that to your phone um, and we provide seven day forecasts for those. Excellent. Uh, Andrew, he said, how can the prediction represent uh, the Melbourne Heads weather for dive boats going out to dive sites? Uh, long sail reports might say 0.5 metre waves and there was four metres in the head. This is quite a big difference. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I need to maybe know a bit more about the um, the details of that one. Um, as I said, our wave forecasts are averages, so potentially that's playing into it. If um, if what they're experiencing um, is is much greater than than what they've looked at in the forecast, um, or maybe some of those effects that Dave's talking about, where if you're in a sheltered um, you know headland, maybe you're a bit more protected from from the swell and the waves. But then as you head out on the boat, maybe those waves are going to be a bit bigger. Okay. Uh, Andre has said, what kind of waves does the combination of swell and wind direction create? So example, a northerly blowing over a southerly swell, does this create larger waves? Yeah, it can have the effect of causing the waves to take a better shape or form. So surfers are obviously pretty interested in offshore winds uh, when the swell is moving in because it creates a nicer shape and curve to the waves. Um, there'll be some degree of effect uh, further out from the surf zone, but not as pronounced as when you get into the surf zone there. Okay. Um, Greg, he's asked a, a, an interesting question as well. I'm hoping that we might be able to answer this. Uh, he is part of the, uh, he lives in Bundaberg, sorry, and they often experience significant rain or storm events traveling towards the coastline from the west. Uh, these often break up as they approach the region, uh, region and split so his question is, because the region that he comes from is predominantly flat, could this flat terrain help with breaking up those storms? Yeah, there are certainly effects in that part of the world that I'm aware of where the thunderstorms do split and they tend to follow um, sort of valley type areas. So they kind of seek out the, the really moist, juicy air um, and they follow those tracks. Um, and that's a, that's a common feature through that part of the world. I guess once they get out over the water, they, they can lose a little bit of that um, uh, surface heating, so you've got intense surface heating over the land and lots of moisture built up there. Um, once they get out, out of the water in that part, they might actually struggle to continue uh, maintaining that strength. And so that's one of the effects that you're probably seeing there. Okay, excellent. Um, Ross has asked, what is the level of accuracy for a forecast on day one and how much does it reduce over the next 10 days? We do have um, some descriptions of that in, uh, I think, in our annual report about um, overall forecast accuracy. Now, it depends on the parameter that you're talking about. Um, it will also depend day to day on the, the weather situation. So there are some weather situations where it's very stable and doesn't change much um, in terms of the weather patterns from day to day for your forecast period. Um, and when we get into those conditions, we can have pretty high accuracy, say four or five days out. There are other times where it's a very dynamic situation, changing very rapidly, um, and it's hard for us to nail the forecast even a day ahead, you know, all the aspects of it. So it depends on the parameter. Rainfall is particularly hard to forecast, for example. Um, the, the swell conditions, they're quite well forecast typically because it's been generated days before and it takes a while to arrive at that area. As I said, thunderstorms are really hard to forecast. So it's a bit of a, um, a tricky one to answer. Uh, it's a sort of broad umbrella. Um, but there are some, some bits of information in our um, annual reports. Yeah, our, our forecast models are continually improving. We've had uh, some significant improvements most recently with the development of the supercomputer and the Bureau is just in the process of rolling out its new access model, which is the foundation of all of our wind forecasts as well as um, the wind forcing in our wave forecast, um, which is driven from the Auswave model. 
Um, this is one of the main models that the forecasters are using to then generate the official forecast. Um, and definitely we report on um, yeah, the improved accuracy of those models relative to other international models as well as the, the previous versions of models, um, which, which yeah, as Dave said, we report on the annual report, but we also have information on our website about the performance of those. Excellent. So um, I do have some news. Margaret has responded uh, to our call. Actually, after that squeeze box performed, we were all a little bit unsure about what that meant. Um, she says it's where there doesn't appear to be much wind, but I'm told it's something to avoid. The average wind appears to be very low, but the actual wind apparently can be very variable and difficult to sail in. Mm. Oh, right. So it sounds like maybe a bit of a gust or a squall potentially. Okay. Um, which if it's squalls and maybe driven from some nearby thunderstorm activity that Dave was mentioning and some of those downdrafts. There's no way to predict that? You can't see that on... There's really short-term term localised effects, not so much as, as, as we said, the indication of thunderstorms in the forecast is maybe um, a prompt for you to be prepared and to be checking those additional resources like the warnings to anticipate them. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, the wind gusts, again, uh, with the observations, you might be looking at what's happening nearby and what are the peak gusts that have been recorded in areas around you um, to, again, maybe anticipate what you might experience in your area. Okay. I think the other point to make, and I think there's a question about this as well, is the configuration of Meta. It's worth keeping in mind that we've got six by six kilometre grid boxes uh, covering the entire Australian domain. Um, so we wouldn't necessarily pick up those really localised effects within that grid. So even though you can get more detail when you go into Meta, you're not necessarily going to get answers to these sorts of questions. And so Australia having such an enormous coastline, we can't possibly forecast all of these local effects. And so it's really about getting that local knowledge and understanding of how different wind directions and wind speeds and other phenomena might affect um, that particular part and this squeeze that you're talking about. So yeah, I, I can't answer it precisely, but there's certainly something uh, like a local effect going on there, some funneling and channeling of the winds, uh, which would typically happen in certain wind directions, I'm guessing. Well, congratulations, Margaret. You taught us something today, the squeeze box, a new term that we can use. Um, we, we're wrapping it up now, so if there are any other questions, please send them in. But I did want to get to one from Graham. He said, for coastal weather sites, um, can they access real-time wind, et cetera, or more information? Are there current buoys that, uh, that we can access to better understand the current set and drift for yacht racing? Yes, yeah, so the, the Bureau operates two wave buoys, one um, on the west coast of Tasmania and one in South Australia. Uh, we also uh, forecast have access to a range of wave buoys that are operated by other agencies. Um, some of those are publicly available, not, not always. Um, weather stations in, in terms of um, beacons, as I mentioned, that might be recording wind speeds uh, are also available. We have our network. There are also ones um, that you might be able to access from port authorities. Um, some of the local sailing clubs or yacht clubs might be recording um, wind speeds as well that might be useful. We, we generally recommend uh, not to use a single observation point um, to be correlating that with what's, what else is happening in the area. Um, and as I was talking about how wind speeds are recorded at 10 metre height above sea level, um, that if you're looking at other non-bureau weather observations that you're um, paying attention to how that site is sighted or um, established to make sure that it, it's um, recording those, like for example, that it's not in a sheltered area and isn't going to be under it re recording the winds. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for all your questions. Um, if you have uh, some that we didn't get to, we're sorry for that, but there are some avenues that uh, we'll be able to uh, direct you in. Lucy, uh, yeah. can you tell us uh, a little bit more about what we spoke about and uh, wrap it all up? Yeah. So just to summarise, we've already covered on off lots, lots of these, which is great. Um, so just to summarise, where you can get all the information from. Um, our key message, obviously, is to check the weather before you go, making sure you're getting those forecast updates as they come out. Um, and in terms of the channels where you can get these forecasts from, once you're out on the water, looking at um, tuning into VHF radio, uh, the specific frequency does change depending on what local area you're in. We recommend tuning into channel 16, which is the distress frequency. That will tell you what channel you should be tuning in for your area and when the forecast and warnings will be getting read out. Um, Marine Light already mentioned, apps and websites we already mentioned. We also recommend using the marine safety apps um, issued by our partner safety agencies. For example, Boating Vic was just launched last year. We provide all of our forecast data to them, so that's definitely a recommended source. 
Um, the telephone weather service, if you want to call a number and have their forecast read out to you, that's another option. Um, and I know some of the more advanced users, especially those going further offshore, also uh, like to use grid data where you can get that model data, really high resolution, um, and plug it into your navigational system. If that's something that you're interested in, we can um, talk about uh, the registered user services um, information on our website. And then, yeah, just lastly, talking to your community, getting in touch with um, others participating in those activities, because they all definitely have all that source of local knowledge as well. Um, and then once you're out on the water, just keeping an eye on the weather and tuning into the radio to get any updates. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your input today, Lucy, and for you, uh, David. We really enjoyed it. If you missed any of those links, they'll be in the presentation notes that you'll receive in an email uh, later on today. Now, our next uh, from webinar, which is pretty exciting. It's going to be on the 5th of March and will provide you with the Autumn 2020 Outlook. A registration link is going to be put in chat now so you can find out. Um, on the screen as well is a whole bunch of great links um, to find out more marine information. And if you have a question that we didn't get to today or you'd like more information, please hit that uh, email link there uh, when you get the notes later on today, customer service at bomb.gov.au. As I mentioned, the webinar uh, is live for Autumn 2020. That's going to be on March the 5th. Um, you will have that link in your chat uh, right now. So that brings us to the end of today's webinar. A uh, big thank you to Lucy and David for your time in developing the content, sharing knowledge with us with us. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. I can't, all the questions yes, I can't wait to meet my imaginary sailboat. Uh, uh, to our audience, thank you for tuning in and joining us today. We hope you enjoyed this session and we will be emailing you a link to the YouTube uh, presentation so you'll be able to watch it again or feel free to share it if you do. Uh, we ask that you tag uh, BOM webinars, hashtag BOM webinars or join the BOM um, Facebook group as well. Uh, as mentioned earlier, this session has been recorded. That's coming out soon. And finally, but most importantly, we want your feedback. It is our aim to bring you the highest possible quality webinar, but we can't do that unless you share your experiences with us. So once we close this webinar, a short survey is going to pop up on your screen and we'd be very grateful if you could complete it uh, anonymously for us. Once again, thank you for your time and we look forward to seeing you soon. Goodbye.